Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where frontline sales leaders teach you how to build and scale an outbound sales team. Welcome back to the Predictable Revenue Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Stewart. Today, I'm joined by somebody who's the director of growth at a venture capital firm called Bowery Capital. And he's coming on here to share how you can build your first playbook. Andrew Odo, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Colin. I'm excited to be here and uh, excited to share a little bit of what we've learned when it comes to getting your revenue engine up and running as an early uh, entrepreneur. Awesome. And we don't want to go into like your whole history, but I'm curious, the, what is, what is a, somebody who's got a real strong background in sales, what do they do in working at a venture capital firm? Yes, it's a great question. So uh, I joined Bowery Capital about two and a half years ago. Um, and one of the trends that we've seen throughout the VC world, started by, by some of the pioneers like Inside Ventures, Andreessen Horowitz, some folks, you know, 10 to 15 years ago, was that simply cutting a check uh, is not good enough for entrepreneurs or, you know, it has become uh, kind of an undifferentiated way of supporting entrepreneurs. And so we've seen the rise of platform within VC um, and platform can be thought of as the value add on the other side of cutting that check, that term sheet to these entrepreneurs. So a lot of uh, firms and portfolios that have many companies will take a community driven approach where they're putting on events, round tables, you know, networking things, connecting um, their entrepreneurs to their early customers. Uh, here at Bowery, we uh, are a little more targeted in our approach. So we help out with all things revenue generating support. We have what's called our, our acceleration team and we're really, really focused on getting you from seed to series A successfully uh, and thinking about some of the different business pieces you need to put in place to successfully do that. So we certainly support our entrepreneurs beyond that, but we're hyper-focused on that early stage and, and helping folks to get that off the ground. My background is mostly being a salesperson at early stage companies. And so that's how I ended up here and helping out with the portfolio. Uh, and that's a little bit of what we do, which I'm sure we'll dive into today. It's, it's a pretty cool role you're in. And in some ways, aside from the money, you're like, you're one of the, the products that they sell, right? You're like your feature or benefit is yeah. we're smart money because we have Andrew. Uh, hopefully that's what folks are saying. I mean, I, one of the quick ways I describe it to folks in our world that we come from that, that aren't as familiar with platform at BC is it's like being a really, hopefully a really good customer success manager. Sure. We can put this product, the money, whatever it is in uh, the entrepreneur's hands, but you want to help train them on that, right? You want to get to know them and what their uh, criteria for success looks like and help them get there. And so we take a really tailored approach uh, to ensure that. Right on. And one of those things that we talked about when we did the pre-interview that you've done a ton with a lot of earlier stage companies is help them put together their first playbook. Exactly. Yeah. I think that, uh, you know, one of the things admittedly I was nervous about when I stepped into this role was I know media tech, I know ad tech, I've sold that before. Um, how much do I really know in order to, to enable other companies on their sales strategy and their marketing strategy early on? And I think what I've been obviously happy to find and, and uh, what's allowed me to continue, you know, to produce in my role is that we all know that, of course, there are nuances to selling in a certain markets, but a lot of it is a somewhat similar playbook. We know you got to figure out your buyer persona. We know you have to figure out some sort of qualification framework if you want to spend more time with customers or less time. You know, we have to come up with some sort of regimen around how we use our CRM and how we negotiate. And, uh, you know, across all companies, that tends to be 50, 60, maybe 70% the same, the same acumen. That's why we see really good SaaS sellers that are able to go across verticals and somehow continue to be successful once they're ramped up uh, in hitting quotas because those skills are transferable. And that's why this is such a great career to be in. But that's one thing that I've found. And so one of the first things that we do, whether it's a, an entrepreneur who's very experienced in sales or someone who's technical and brand new to sales is to think about this roadmap and the boxes we need to check off and create this all in one uh, process document to help them get there. And so when you, when you're looking at the, the playbook, what's like, walk, walk me through the sort of what's included. And I may, you know what, maybe before I start, what's the, what's the sort of value that this, that documenting all the processes and, and getting, you know, all of this written down ahead of time before you ramp up and hire say 50 or I don't know, to five reps. Sure, sure. Yeah. And so like, 
Let me talk about the benefits. Let me first define it in one sentence. So a sales playbook, it's basically the main pillars of, of processes that you have to understand in order to go to market and sell. Right. So some of those things I mentioned before, and it's all consolidated in one place too. Right. I think the reason we came up with this, we're not the only ones to come up with it, but the reason it's become such a part of our culture and working with entrepreneurs is that when you get in that hot seat and all of a sudden $3 million have been wired to your bank account and the pressure's on and there's expectations, there's so much you need to pay attention to, right? Uh, it's endless. And all of a sudden, whether you wanted to be a seller or not, you have to be amongst many other things. And so we created it originally, uh, at least this version of it for seed stage CEOs and sellers, just to keep folks really, really focused on what they need to do over the course of the next 18 months. Most people are raising their series A round uh, about 18 to 24 months after they raise their seed. They have to get to around a million and a half to $2 million of revenue in order to successfully do that. Um, and that has gone up significantly year over year over year. And so the reason that this body of processes all in one place is important is that it keeps you focused. Um, it's going to help you to reduce your cost of acquisition around customers. So, you know, we'll throw out a lot of acronyms today, but CAC, it's going to bring that down. It's going to increase your ARR, right? Because you're thinking about each of these bucketized processes and you're AB testing things within them to see, Hey, what helps us close the most deals and at what speed? Um, the other thing I really like about this is we all know as time goes on, whether we like to believe it or not, and we know it to the point where it's, it's an episode in the show, Silicon Valley, that's a joke. Sales doesn't always get along with every other department as time goes on. Um, sometimes, you know, they are the tip of the spear. They're over-promising, under-delivering. These things happen in quickly growing startups. I'm not going to pretend that's not the case. Having a sales playbook that you collaborate on uh, across department allows you to mitigate a little bit of the confusion there and allows us all to get on the same page and say, you know what? We went to product to get these ideas on how we pitch the product. We went to marketing to get these ideas on what our ICP and our buyer persona looks like. We went to, you know, ops and finance to actually uh, tailor our negotiation matrix and how we use our CRM so that the data is coming through clean to them on the other side and they can collect payment and whatnot and forecast correctly. And so in addition to reducing your cost of acquisition and increasing the rate at which you uh, produce ARR in addition to keeping you very focused. It's a nice cross uh, team exercise early on to all get on the same page and, and kind of put all your minds together as to how you're going to go to market and sell. It, essentially it's accelerating. It's doing, it's basically all the things that you would eventually figure out and front loading that work so that you're not making the mistakes of trying to move too fast. And you're always going to make certain mistakes, but this is just Hey, here's some mistakes we've made in the past because we didn't have this documented and proceduralized. So let's get that done ahead of time so you can make new and better mistakes. Totally. Like, and we know that you're going to make mistakes as investors, right? We, we invest oftentimes in just people and no product, but we want to see their thought process and how they're going to go about, to your point, accelerating, getting to those mistakes and understanding them and moving on. That also goes for talent too. I think this is a huge tool for attracting impressive talent. It's always a risk to go to an early stage startup, but if you want to get that killer VP of sales or, Hey, that person who's making a great OTE and is now going to swap that out and take on some equity in their package and joining your company. Well, one way to put them at ease, right? Is to say, Hey, I don't know if these are all the right answers but here's something you're going to get on day one. And here's something we want you to help us think through. This is the guide that we're looking to build together. And we've already started to put the pieces in place. Can you help us um, step it up to the next level? I think it's a great tool to attract talent. I, I can't agree more because the, especially if you're trying to like, I think we can all agree that you're not going to get the best account execs unless you're going and finding passive candidates, right? The people that are actively looking for jobs, are not always the best, best talent. Sometimes it happens from my experience. I got to go find people that are looking, but they're not responding to job ads. They're not so upset just because the window of them being upset to being in another role is very short, especially if they're a top performer. It's a very totally. quick window. And so when you're trying to convince somebody to, Hey, you want to eject yourself from this place where you're making good commission, you know, you've, you're set up, you're rocking and rolling. One of the bars that you need to, pass over is, Hey, we've got our shit together, 
right? Here's, here's the plan. Here's how we're going to do it. This it's like a, it's, it might not be a closing tool, but it's one of those things that is going to help them assess the maturity of the organization. Totally. Totally. I think, and I think it creates, you only have one chance to, to create a first impression, right? And it shows that you're very serious about sales within your org and figuring it out. Uh, the other thing I'd say, right, you bring up a great point, Colin, which is that the window is extremely short, short for successful sellers in their current role, crushing it to going to their next role and hopefully doing the same. And so you have to be differentiated in your approach too. The, being an early founder, at least the perspective that I'm coming from, it, it's not enough to just say, hey, you're going to be uh, making a lot of money because you, you might not immediately make more money than you did before. Um, I think that one positioning strategy is, hey, if this works out, you're going to be the first to sign on all of the really interesting, cool, massive customers. But I think the other thing is the reality of being a seller at an early stage company is that you're working on more than just some of the repetitious things that sometimes happen um, in more complex sales organizations. And so this is a conversation starter to say, like, I really need help on these other things that you might also want to learn that might be differentiated from where you're at right now. Um, that I need you to be my, my um, right-hand person on. And so I think it's a good conversation starter for that from a talent perspective. 100%. And I want to jump into sort of what that playbook looks like. Maybe we can do a quick sort of overview of like, what are all the pieces? And then we can jump into sort of the individuals and let's get tactical for a little bit here. So depending on the maturity of your organization, these things can be five pages long. Um, there are pretty complex sales orgs where there are a hundred pages long, right? And maybe any member of the business side of the org reads section one. And then if you're an AE and you have to know end to end selling, you got to read all sections and whatnot. And so I just want to stress that they come in many different shapes and sizes. Um, we always encourage our founders to start with like a five to 10 page to 15 page, just basic process doc. Um, thinking about some main pillars. And so if I look at mine and, and the one that we coach a lot of our founders on, first and foremost, ICP and buyer persona, ICP being ideal customer profile in this case, uh, and buyer persona mapping. It's literally just a matrix and a template where we say whether you know who you're selling to and you want to define that, or you're just in user research mode, we have to start with a thesis here and we have to start to bucket what do the demographics look like? What industry do they come from? What compelling signals do they show? What do they care about within your product? So the buyer is everything and we start with that. Um, the next section we tend to look at is, okay, you want to approach that buyer. If you want to do a sales marketing hybrid of this playbook, you might talk about channels through which you approach these individuals and messaging you start to use. I'll tell you, as an investor, as a buyer, as a seller, one of the, the funniest things to me is that you might have an amazing product and an amazing value you can deliver behind that product. Um, but if you can't nail the first 30 seconds of that messaging and conveying <laughs> that messaging, yep. it's no good, right? We, we like to say you have a minute to earn five minutes of my time, five minutes of my time to earn 30 minutes and 30 minutes for a follow-up meeting. And so the second section of this playbook is just starting out with your basic outbound messaging, whether that's from a marketing perspective or a sales perspective and starting to think about your channels. We then move and you can, you can kind of see like, Oh, this is moving down the funnel. That's kind of by design. Uh, we then move on to qualification questions. Once you're talking to that buyer, whether that buyer is an actual buyer an investor, whoever it may be, uh, what are the things that you want to dig into to see if they're a fit to spend more time with you? And when I describe qualification to, some of our folks early on are entrepreneurs who are maybe technical and who are not used to it and are saying, why am I asking all these questions? Remember, this is, this is a game of time all the time, but certainly early on, you only have 18 to 24 months to get to what you need to get to for your series A. And so if you're not qualifying really well and, and deciding who you want to spend good quality time with, uh, then you're kind of dead in the water. Well, I'll pause there. Any questions or anything you want to dig in? deeper on there. I think, I think good to start. And then we'll get a little bit deeper. Like we'll, we'll finish the list and then we'll come back to ICP and we'll, we'll figure out like what goes where and. Cool. And as you can imagine, it basically moves further down the, down the funnel. What's our pitch look like? How do we use our CRM? How do we negotiate at the end of the funnel and, yeah. and so on and so forth. Perfect. So, so let's go back to the top here. So it starts with sure. ideal customer profile. 
So what is that in the buyer persona? So what does that look like to you? Yeah. So I think to me, um, again, I'm coming from the B2B software world and the marketplace world. And so it's not enough to just say, here's everybody who downloaded our app, right? Or here's, you know, maybe daily. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe daily usage. Sorry, you go first. Yeah, maybe daily usage is important and things like that. Or, or, or yeah, folks who raised their hand and said they're interested. It's not really enough, right? And so when we talk about what that looks like to us, first of all, you got to think about your total addressable market, at least from the investor perspective and the founder and early seller perspective. You know, how many of this type of buyer persona uh, are really out there? Because that, that's another thing that I think will slow down everything from your revenue growth to your fundraising growth, if, if there just isn't enough of that type of buyer out there, um, that's a problem. I think the other big question, right, that a lot of folks ask early on is, how do I know if I'm going too wide or too narrow on this? Like I could talk to everybody, but I might not get anywhere. Uh, I can only talk to one that I have maybe a thesis around, but it might turn out that's not really my buyer. And so one thing I encourage folks to do is just pick three to four, three, four or five buyer personas and ideal company types early on. Um, Maybe your quarterly goal in your first quarter or two of selling is obviously not to to close deals with them right away because maybe you're just starting off, you don't have a product yet, but to have 30 qualified conversations, meaningful conversations with that type of buyer, each of those types of buyers in the first quarter. And that'll help you start to build a pipeline. But in terms of what it looks like to me, right, you're trying to figure out the ideal type of company and ideal type of buyer and some of their attributes, right? What what are some of the signals that you can see before you talk to them, right, Um, to identify that they're probably a fit for your product? And then, of course, there's some more nuanced things that you try to identify once you are talking to them in terms of how they would use this. Are they an end decision maker, an end user, an influencer? Are they all of those things? These are some of the things we start to look for with the, uh, with the ideal buyers. And so what are the, what are the ways that you're like, when you're coming up with that list, you're looking at, you know, we talked about sort of demographics, signals, features, how do you sort of differentiate between the things you're looking for with the company and things that you're looking for within the individual? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And so I think you look at, each of those buckets for ideal company and ideal uh, buyer within the company, but then there's different questions you ask within those buckets. And what I mean by that is for, if we're looking at ideal company and demographics, we're thinking uh, 30,000 feet, what's the industry they're in? Uh, what, what, you know, what are some publicly available things like number of employees they have, revenue, financials, um, uh, and, and things like that, right? Factual things about the company that, if you're operating on a lean budget, you can get for free from LinkedIn. You can get for free from even Wikipedia. You can go to their financial statements if you're selling into the types of companies that are public. Um, these are demographic things we're looking at when it comes to the ideal company. Region might be one of those things. But then when we're looking at demographics with the buyer within the company, now we're looking at things like title and seniority. Uh, are they part of a certain division or business unit? Um, Have they been at the company for a certain amount of years or maybe the opposite? Maybe we want someone who's, you know, more of a digital native, hasn't been there for 30 or 40 years and is open to change and purchasing new products. And so, again, what we're looking at for the demographic layer, ideal company, buyer, factual things like that. Can I add one piece before you move on? I love the way that you're, you're describing it. It's factual pieces about the company. So many times I hear, um, people say, well, I, I just want people that are left-handed that have brown eyes and uh, they, only, they only want to buy on-premise software. Yeah. Like, well, that, a database, you can't find that signal in a database. There are some substitution things that you could try and find to, to sort of build that list, but everything you sort of listed here, industry number, employees, title, seniority, time at the company, these are all gatherable from a database. And, and this is the sort of, this is where a roadblock where I see a lot of people get lost is they put all these things that you can't build into a list into their ICP and it makes it impossible to go from theoretical to practical. And what I mean by that is the theory, the theory of you've got this ICP and persona on a, on a slide in a deck 
to an actual list of fucking accounts and contacts. Because yeah. at the end of the day, that's why we're doing this is so we can actually build those lists for our sales teams. And that when the sales teams go out and they chase, they chase, they, they chase those companies and chase those people, they can actually, they have a very easy way of understanding what you what you meant and they can build that list exactly how you wanted it and they don't have to make any guesses. Totally agree with you. I think the, the, the mindset you have to have when you're building this, at least the demographic layers, if I can't search this like Google, or if, if I'm lucky enough to have access to some of the great databases out there, um, if I can't search that, then, then that's a problem. Right. And furthermore, I'll, I'll take it one step further, which is that maybe you're talking to who you think is the right person but you're not really sure if you can start to describe these attributes to them. I mean, we've seen, we'll talk about outbound emails in a moment, but we've seen emails where it's like, if you're not the right person, who is, well, I don't know if you can't describe to me who the right person is, how am I supposed to know who the right person is? So if you say, Hey, it tends to be someone in this division or that division who has an, who's been around for this long, who has an interest in this type of thing. Oh, you know, I want to help you, but help me help you, right? Guide me towards who you ultimately need to get to. And these demographic things will help with that. Yeah. If you, just like you, like you're saying, if you can't say, I typically talk to, when you hit a gatekeeper and they're like, oh, I, we don't have that role here. You're like, well, I typically, typically talk to the VP of marketing, you know, it, it, how, it, how is this piece handled there? Right. It's very helpful to be able to triangulate in. And then as your sales team, and this is, I'm totally distracting and I'll, I'm going to pass it back to Andrew in a sec, but the I, ICP is not something that in my opinion is a static document. It's you build this, you give it to the sales team. They go chase these people down. They come back with feedback. Either it worked, it didn't work. And then you update the ICP, right? It's got to be this continuous loop. Totally agree. And the beautiful thing about this is if you do build it like this early on and you are properly logging it in your CRM, which we'll get to in a moment, it, it's not a game of guessing later on, right? Or at least it's a little more objective. We're like, okay, when we go out to these types of companies or these types of folks, buy this demographic objective factual data, well, this one's working out, you know, 50% better than this one. And so where are we going to pour more gasoline on the fire to use a cliche term. Uh, obviously the one that's showing objectively that, that it's working better though. And then the one thing, and then we can go deeper into the playbook if you want to uh, move on. But the other thing I'll say about compelling signals is nailing both that top layer demographics and then compelling signals that this individual is showing is the difference to me between having a first sales conversation that f feels like a first sales conversation and a first sales conversation that feels like a second conversation. I understand what's going on at your organization. I've researched it. I've read the news. You know, maybe I've set up Google alerts, Twitter, Twitter alerts, things like that on what your organization is doing or what you're doing. LinkedIn alerts as to what you're putting out there socially and whatnot. Uh, and then when I approach you, we're having a much warmer conversation because we've thrown out all those BS questions about like, how's the weather? Like all the things that we're jumping on and doing in the beginning. And we're cutting to the chase of like, hey, I saw there's a lot of changes going on with A, B, and C in our industry right now, have you seen that? It looks like you guys are doing a little bit of that too. And wow, now we're having a much more meaningful conversation right off the bat. I, I couldn't agree more. It's those sort of trigger events that make that, that just open up that conversation, give you a reason to reach out, give you a, reach, a reason to pick up the phone, a reason to send the email, right? Totally. We're all, you know, I think, I imagine a lot of us that, are, that have SDRs, have SDR teams or are SDRs are looking at, you know, how do we personalize each of our emails? these compelling signals, these trigger events are amazing ways, right? Cause it's something external that says, Hey, they're, you know, X percent more likely to be in a buying cycle because they've done this thing. If you can yeah. stack a few of those signals on top of each other, it makes cold emailing turn into feel almost like warm prospecting. Yeah. And for the brand new sellers out there who are weary of getting in this career because they're envisioning, you know, maybe the not so great sellers that haven't used these signals, uh, this is what helps you get over that fear of rejection and someone not answering or hanging up the phone. Good research around your buyer persona and ICP. People are good, right? They are not jerks. If they see that you've put that research in, they might say, it's not me, but like, I appreciate you reaching out with thoughtful outreach, knowing who you're trying to, to get to. Let me guide you in the right direction or, or let's talk later in the year when it makes more sense. Totally. So much of that rejection stems from you're wasting my time and mm -hmm. you're wasting my time because this is not relevant to me. Right. Totally. When you do find somebody that's relevant, the amount of times when I was cold calling that somebody thanked me 
for like, Hey, thanks for making the, thanks for like reaching out. Thanks for doing this. Right. And then if you track that, thank you all the way down the buying cycle, buying cycle. And then you look at them being successful as a customer within your company. You think about the value that you created just by identifying the right person, opening up that conversation and letting your sales team take over. It's a tremendous amount of value. Totally agree. Seeing as we're talking outbound strategy already, this seems like outbound and, and, channels and messaging. This feels like the next sort of piece of the playbook. So what, what does that look like to you? Sure. And so I think when it comes to documenting your outbound and the channels and, and um, language, again, nothing's set in stone. Certain sellers are different from each other. They might come up with their own style, but this is about reducing the time that you're wasting. If we know for a fact that one channel is just way better than another channel, well, well we should be paying attention to that. And, and so we're mitigating the, the amount of time that you're wasting by documenting this. Some of the things that, that you need to experiment with are certainly the channels. Um, and I think, especially for early sellers, oftentimes the problems are twofold. They're not utilizing enough channels. Maybe they're just comfortable with email, maybe just um, phone calls. And we've actually seen from great statistics like folks, folks at Sales Loft and Gong and, and things like that, that you need to utilize a multi-channel strategy. So that's, that's one thing that we've seen. Now, what is the blend of those channels? That's, that's one question. Second question is, what does the cadence look like? So HubSpot had a really wonderful statistic that was at least accurate a few years ago. I'd imagine it still is now, but something like 40% of sellers give up after one touch, but 80% of sales take multiple touches, you know, oftentimes at least five. We see cadences that are a lot longer than that. And so coming up with the right strategy of, and by touches, I mean, you know, outbound emails, calls, LinkedIn messages. Some folks are considering like trade shows and events and conversations there to be touches and, and outbound as well. Um, multifaceted in terms of the channels and the number of times you're reaching out. And then what's the language, right? Uh, and, and that's another thing that we've learned a lot about. Um, you know, there's... There's templated, there's targeted, there's tailored. I think that comes from John Barros in terms of like the specificity of, of how deep you're going to go. And that really comes down to the buyer research we just talked about. But statistics have shown that if you reach out and at the beginning of your messaging, you're saying the reason I reached out to you and you have some sort of tailored message. Well, now you're going from the average uh, cold email response approximately of 10%. So maybe 15 or 20%. While that might not sound huge, that makes you 50 or 100% better than your competition. So having these, the point is having these different templates documented and thinking about the structure. Because again, with what we said at the beginning of the call, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. It has to be a compelling reason to reach out. Social proof helps in terms of logos, use cases, others you work with. Um, call to action at the end of the email. People aren't going to you know, get on the phone or... Um, you know, hang out with you just because you said, let me know. Having a compelling call to action at the end is really important too. And so having these things documented and A-B testing these things is, is really important. I love it because there, there is no right or wrong sequence, cadence, whatever you want to call it. And I think like I, I have the luxury of, um, of working with like clients in a bunch of different industries. And even within our own internal SDR team, if we're going after a SaaS company versus somebody in a more traditional like manufacturing industry, that playbook looks completely different because the older industries, they pick up the phone. And yeah, so a totally. really phone heavy. So if you hear anybody like any thought leader talking about, Oh, it's gotta be phone, phone, phone. It's like, well, that's probably true. If you're going after manufacturers, if you're going I after, agree more. if you're going after product managers in San Francisco, phone, 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 <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we hear this, uh, I'll bring up maybe a spicy subject, but we hear this like millennials don't pick up the phone. And then, uh, you know, millennials saying like, well, email is where it's at. And so the bottom line is uh, experiment for sure. A-B test for sure. You need to do that, but you got to measure it, right? Who, who, you might have an inkling as to what works, but the statistics, statistics have shown that multi-channel strategies are important to at least test with, probably important to use full time. Um, and you got to measure what works because I totally agree with your point. I mean, I, I worked with a company once that sold into DevOps and someone said like, <laughs> you got to pick up the phone more. And I was like, you're probably better off like hacking into their code base and putting a secret message in there to get through to them than maybe, you know, calling them on their desk phone, which 
doesn't exist. And so yeah. think about your buyer and the channel through which they like to communicate. Definitely a good point. For sure. And just to tie it into what you're saying above is like, what is the, what is happening? Sorry. It's the similar idea as, as we were talking about, like when a salesperson is looking for a job, right? What is the window of opportunity there? And think about it for your product. What is the window of opportunity for your product? Right. I, I remember working with a DevOps company and they had this one thing that their, their outbound wasn't working for them. It's like, okay, well, let's look into why we actually got our product manager involved. And it turned out that when something breaks within the sort of realm of their product category, the like it's catastrophic. The engineers go and they spend a couple of days researching, they get a tool, they buy it, and that's the buying window. And so that's an impossible buying target to hit, right? If you think about, let's say the industry has, they got 5,000 targets they want to hit. There's no way in hell you're going to hit that right buying window. If there's, if everybody's got one a year, your chances of actually finding somebody in a buying window are like infinitesimal. Yeah. Very, very small. Yeah. And, and I think you bring up a good point, which moves us a little further down the playbook, which is um, what is the very first thing you offer them? And of course, what are you going to offer them in the end? But like, what is the beginning of your pitch? Mm -hmm. Um, And as we look at more complex buying cycles in terms of time length, or as we look at inboxes getting flooded with more and more emails or just, you know, the amount of robo calls we get or calls we get that just aren't worth my time or our time, you really need to start to think about some of the levers of influence early on and, and, uh, and value-based selling um, with reciprocity. And what I mean by that is your approach needs to be, and you need to get to a place where you're confident in this, um, hey, I want to talk to you for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever that might be. Uh, I promise because of A, B, and C reasons that I have something that's informative or helpful or valuable to you that we can talk about in this first conversation. If we go our separate ways, I will have had a valuable experience from getting to know our buyers better. You will have had a valuable experience because I gave you some ideas from our most recent white paper or you know, I educated you on other offerings in the market, including ours. Whatever it may be, that reciprocity lever of having value in your first initial pitch is super important. And I think where, where I round this back to your point you just made, Colin, is then they'll think of you when that short buying window comes up. Oh, you know who's been helpful is, you know, Colin always reaches out with these helpful things or we've gotten to know each other over the past year. We weren't ready to buy, but I just get value out of the interactions. That's the first person I'm going to go to. Mm-hmm. So as we think about going down this playbook and, and mapping out what are the valuable things we offer at every stage of the funnel um, that are worth their time in their own right, right? We're just trying to sell them on that then and spending more time with us. Well, that's how you move folks down this complex buying cycle when there's a lot of noise. Or that's one way of doing it. Certainly. It makes it makes so much, it's going to make your life so much easier if you're at least if you have an idea of what their buying cycle looks like as you build out your sales playbook. Sure. Right? The channels, the the cadence, the everything is going to be heavily influenced by when they buy, how they buy, why they buy. Yeah. And to your point there, you show a lot of your intelligence around the sector of the buyer by asking smart questions, right? And questions that signal to this person on the other end, like, I'm going to have a good experience here. Mm-hmm. You know, questions like, tell me about something like this that you bought in the past and like what, what you guys think about on your end, what you get tripped up on. Or like my favorite qualification question, maybe not right off the bat, but what do you love about your current way of doing X? Or, you know, what do you love about your current product X? Um, what could be better? I like that because um, I'm not out of the gate saying, hey, what keeps you up at night? What do you hate about that? It's not, it's not glass half empty right out, off the bat. I'm asking you something that shows that I'm being thoughtful around what your current way of doing things, trying to assess what the competition is for me um, and what could be better in terms of what you want next out of your solution. 100%. I, I think so much of the sales process is trying to convince somebody that I can add value, right? And the and the best way to, to prove that you're not going to do that is to ask the wrong questions that are just totally off. And you're like, okay, so tell me about what you guys are doing about your purchases. Like when you yeah. buy, it's like, what? 
Like it's, it's so, if the question's so far to left field, but if you're like, okay, well, Hey, I know you're this type of company and typically you're, you know, I see you have a CFO and a director, which means you probably handle your ARR or your, sorry, your accounts receivable this way. Talk to me about like, you know, I bet if you're this size company, you probably have a, you know, you're carrying an ARR of like a couple hundred thousand. That must be stressful. And you've gone from like, tell me about how you like, how you collect to like a very specific question that just in that, in the way I framed it up and I made that up on the spot, but like, it's pretty good. (laughs) I understand your business and I'm, I've been here, I've done this before and it just puts you on, it's a, it's a whole other level than every other salesperson that's calling in just trying to cold call and say, Hey, I do this, I do that. Can I help you? Yeah. And the other thing is, um, we're not having a one way conversation anymore, right? When you do that. Mm-hmm. Now I'm being thoughtful about what you want. And, and also, of course, doing it through the lane through which I'm driving and what, what I want to drive home. But, you know, now we're having a back and forth conversation and the what's in it for me attitude. Um, it's not just what's in it for me, but the buyer's starting to think, oh, there's something in it for me here too. Totally. And, and now that we've got them, like once you've got them to that point, you know, they haven't hung up on you yet or you've, you're able to book the meeting. Now you've got your second meeting. It's, it's always a mix of sort of demonstrating expertise through um, the questions you ask. And it's, it's kind of this, this sort of push and pull game of like, and uh, you know, we had, um, had a couple of the guys uh, on the, the show from outreach and it was, I think it was Mark Cosaglo who talked about sort of you, you earn a little bit of social capital by sure. asking really good questions. And then you spend a little bit when you ask your qualification questions and you just need to make sure the account doesn't run empty because that's when they hang up on you. I love that. That's yeah. a great way to think of it. I think the other interesting thing you see is that you reach out for this meeting but then statistics have shown that actually the best reps spend less time talking and more time listening. And people think to themselves, well, how could that be? I reached out to you to try and present you something. And then you end up talking 70% of the time. And I talk 30% of the time. Well, if you're asking these thoughtful questions, you're getting them talking. First of all, people want to be heard, right? They want to, you know, mention all of these things that they're, they're, they're kind of, um, navigating through. But secondly, then as we go further down from that discovery call to that pitch, then the script flips and actually the reps are talking a little bit more than the buyer is. But that's okay because you talk about social capital, you've earned their trust and you're also tailoring it more to what they need. So if we go back to that buyer persona and the features that they care about, I mean, you should never be showing 100% of your product, probably in any demo call. Um, That's boring and that's all about you. But Maybe if you're only showing 40 or 50%, who cares? Because you've tailored it to the things you've learned early on. And now you've built up in your account analogy, you've built up a little bit more of the balance on the side that you want to build up to get more time with them and drive them further down the funnel. For sure. I I wish, could you call like me from 15 years ago and and tell him that? (laughs) (laughs) Me too. I mean, seriously. (laughs) The, like, I love Gong, Chorus, all those tools, uh, exec vision that do all the recording. Um, and I'm so thankful that they didn't exist back when I first started selling. <laughs> You'd be crushed. I would too. I'm with uh, you. I'd just be totally roasted. Yeah. I, <laughs> you develop a certain reputation as like somebody who can sell. And then one of those videos or call recordings leaks and they're like, whoa, this, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But that's fine. The best sellers are, are good at evolving and iterating, right? I think being an SCR is one of the hardest jobs out there because the standard is, I think like nine, 10 or 11% on response to cold emails and cold outbound and things like that. And so it's the highest point of failure in the funnel, but again, incremental gains make all the difference. Um, and it's also just a skill that, that carries through to your career much later on in, in really nice ways. hundred percent. I I'd say anecdotally, the, the most successful account execs that I've seen have all started in, uh, as an, as an SDR. Like, yeah, I, I would agree. I have a very strong preference to hiring account execs that have already been SDRs. Cause I think my biggest complaint about SDRs five years ago was they don't know how to follow up. They don't know what it means to work for a meeting. I right? just, they, they sit around, they want to, and I'm generalizing hugely here. Sure, uh, sure, I, sure. Probably, you Somewhere know, there's an SDR out there, you know, ringing his or her fist listening to this, but I totally agree. For sure. You just, you don't appreciate it until you've had to grind and do it yourself. And then when you, when you get into that role, you, I think you have, a, one, you have a much 
uh, better appreciation for the work that went into generating that meeting because you don't have to do it for yourself anymore. And, and two, your follow-up game is so much stronger. You know, that, that actually reminds me of a really good point, though, that rounds back to this whole thing, which is that just because it is a grind, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't make it easier for your folks to figure this out with a playbook like this. And the other thing I hate to see, and I, I call executives out on this, honestly, when I'm working with them, is if a seller fails and they have to leave the company or they're put on a performance plan or these things happen, we got to look at ourselves in the mirror as managers, leaders, investors, advisors, or whatever, and say, did we do the absolute best job to prepare them for success? I mean, if you have something like this in place, you can at least say, hey, we made an attempt, right, to train folks to give them the keys to success. You know, during onboarding, we had a meeting where we walked through what a typical funnel looks like and typical metrics look like with this playbook as our foundation, and it didn't work out versus oh, we didn't give them any of that and they failed. Well, you should look yourself in the mirror and you, know, you kind of have an on, honest dialogue with yourself as a leader as to did I prepare my sales um, contributors and individual performers to the best of my ability to get out there and do this job that's already really, really hard. And this, this helps you, um, hopefully helps you sleep better at night you know, with those decisions either way. I, I totally agree. And I, I think some people have a, a tough time separating the individual from the individual's performance. And I like to use the analogy of, if you think about you've designed a circuit board and then you, you plug a capacitor, you, you sort of, I don't know, you put a capacitor on there, you get it all wired up, you flip the power on, an hour later, the capacitor blows out. It's like, was it the capacitor's fault or was it your fault? You designed yeah. the system, right? You soldered it on there. So who's, whose fault was it? Yeah. Yours capacitor. Did you put the wrong size capacitor? Did you put something in capacitor when you needed a resistor? This is like well beyond my electrical engineering knowledge. Um, uh, yeah, I can solder, but I can't, uh, I couldn't design a board. But if you think about that in the context of a sales team or of, or of an individual that you're plugging into the system, you've got to have the right uh, amount of capacity there. You have to have the right, you know, pieces on the board. You need to have the right systems that they're running. Um, and if there, if there's a failure, it's a failure of the system, not necessarily a failure of the engineer. Sometimes there are shitty capacitors though. Yeah, of course. But you use some key words there, which are design and system, right? And so if we talk about how much of sales is art and how much of sales is science, people debate this all the time, but I do think it's a little more science than it is art. I do think that there has to be a system in place, um, to help ensure success or measure why we're failing. If you go deeper down this playbook, right, we talk about how you should document how you map your sales funnel. You should document how you like to use your CRM. First of all, you should do that so that your future sales ops person isn't, you know, pulling their hair out <laughs> trying to get reps to adhere to this and everything. Yeah. But, but you should do that, right? Because then to go back to your analogy, you can say, did we design the wrong system or, you know, were we putting good capacitors in place and, um, and they were failing for another reason, right? Because the measurements have shown that they should succeed and now they're failing. Those are things you got to document, right? Like what does the roadmap to selling success look like metrics wise in terms of how we use our tools? What does a good system look like? And, and so that begs the other question, right? Um, rounding out part of this conversation. This is an evolving and living and breathing thing. Like you said that of the buyer persona column, but, but it really is for all parts of this. I encourage folks to, Look at this more often early on, review it quarterly, you know, do a quarterly meeting with the team um, to, to ensure that we are up to date on our best outbound channels. We are up to date on how to use the CRM. We're up to date on like what things we're allowed to negotiate on or not negotiate on. There's a competition section of this. Are we up to date on who the latest competitors are? That brings the team back to sync up on this regularly. Um, it's great to assign roles to who owns each of these sections. So you had mentioned, you know, when we were talking before the call, how do you actually enforce this and make sure like it stays up to date and the processes are put in place. And so having different individuals own each section is great. You can have them train new folks who are um, onboarding onto the team on each section. You kill two birds with one stone there because um, you're training that new person and they're meeting a new member of the team. Um, you can divide the workload as a leader by having other folks own these things. And it's a great ch uh, chance, especially as your organization scales massively and quickly, to assign many leadership roles to different members of the team and, and to kind of uh, suss out who's really going to be like the good next SDR manager 
Let's have two or three different people own that part of the sales playbook, see how they do. Own the training for that, the management of it, everything. You know, who is going to be the next great marketer at our company? Let's have them own the buyer persona and the competition section and give them a little bit of, a, of something they can be proud of and, and update and, and own as well. So. And I, I love the, what you're suggesting there, which is having everybody own a single section. And then when somebody new starts, the person that owns it is going to teach that. And that it, it builds, again, coming back to the process, it builds in a loop where every time you're onboarding somebody new, I know I'm going to have to onboard them on this specific section. I'm probably going to double check and make sure that my section is up to date. Totally. And so now you've got, you've got the, the automatic updates enabled. Yeah. I mean, it creates a, a system of accountability, right? Um, and, you know, we didn't come up with this on our own. If you read Mark Roberge's book on his time at HubSpot, he talks about accountability of both the teachers and the students. And so there are aspects to this where maybe there's a test at the end of each section or at the end of this playbook. I mean, this is getting intense maybe for a seed stage company, but for a later stage company, perhaps there's a test and then you're cold calling certified or you're pitch certified as a rep. By the way, let's measure those reps um, six months in and see which ones are the most successful. See who onboarded them on what. Where are they failing? Oh, Andrew taught them about competition and we seem to be losing a lot of deals of competition. Like, let's retrain Andrew on how he's teaching that and, and there's accountability there for the teachers too. It's such a great point. And I can't remember if it was from Mark's book or just I've had a couple of conversations with Mark about this, but I know the way that they were handling sales in the early days of HubSpot were, was actually causing churn. And when they started looking at it, they had a couple of sellers that had, if I'm remembering it correctly, they had a few sellers that had higher than average churn rates. And so when they mm -hmm. dug in and they looked at their process, they were basically, they weren't setting great expectations. Right. And we all know that if you're setting the wrong expectations, if you're telling people that, you know, this thing can do X and it can only do sort of half X, or if you're telling them X and it only does Y, right. Customers aren't going to stick around long enough. Mm -hmm. And they weren't compensating their reps based on how long the customer stuck around for. They were just saying, close as many of them as you possibly can. And Mark had a couple of pretty extreme examples where, <laughs> you know, I think I want to say for the, it was like, they were, paying up to like two or three X commissions for, for deals that stuck around full term. Right. And to the, to the point where he almost, I think they went away from, yeah, I, I don't want to get it wrong, but there was a pretty strong multiplier. If you're, if you were selling deals that stuck around for at least the first full year, and there was a pretty strong incentive not to sell deals that were going to churn in three months to the point where like they took it to the extreme. And that was the entire commission plan was based on how long you're, how much commission you made was based on how, how long the customer was sticking around. Yeah, I, I recall that from the book. And by the way, we've seen this in other industries, gamifying metrics. And that's going to happen, right? People are going to look in their lane at the metric they need to hit and do everything they can to hit that. And maybe other metrics fall out of play. Another example of this was um, there was a case study on a hospital or, or a hospital system, can't recall exactly which one, a few years ago, where they were measured on the number of patients that died in their emergency rooms. Well, that seems like maybe a good measurement, right? We want to reduce deaths in our emergency rooms. However, what would happen is then uh, in certain triage situations, they wouldn't let in patients who looked like they were most likely to die. They would triage others ahead of them. And wow, that's really bad. Is that really <laughs> fixing the system? And so we see this across industries. Metrics get gamified. But one way, I think, to at least reduce that is to have a holistic view across departments and across your whole system to look at those metrics. And so when you're building this playbook, if customer success is building it in tandem with sales, and then they can raise their hand and say, you know, it's great that we've documented this metric as one we want to hit. It's great that we've told them to use the CRM this way. But have you guys over in the sales world thought about, you know, how it's affecting this churn down the line? If, if we set this meeting quarterly to update this document with all the leaders who are in charge of it, I can't promise you that gamification of these metrics in a negative way isn't going to happen, but I can bet that it'll be reduced or you'll get to the heart of the problem quicker. I mean, if you think about, and I know I say this as, as somebody who's been in sales for a long time, that the idea that salespeople are coin operated is somewhat true, right? You're when a significant portion of your compensation is based on hitting certain metrics 
you, that's essentially the firmware for your operating system, or that's your operating system or the firmware for whatever, right? That's what the company is telling you. Those are the activities and those are the, um, the pieces that they say are important to us and we're going to pay you the more you do these, right? So it's, it's not, it's almost, it's not even like maliciously, you know, like there's no malicious intent to it. It's just, I'm looking out as an individual contributor, I'm trying to get the most money for myself. And so I'm going to follow this to the letter, common sense aside, this is what, this is the operating system you've given me. So I'm going to follow that because that's how I get paid. A hundred percent true. And it's, it's on the leadership to talk to each other about what you want to do as a whole. I had an experience as a seller where we were selling a new product and we did very well. We destroyed our number on like the first or second quarter of selling this product. And then we, of course, were super happy. It was the end of the year. And then the next quarter we found out like the product and marketing team was all upset because we, we sold some of the less than ideal customers that they wanted to be on that product. So one business unit celebrating, another business unit saying, oh, this is a headache coming our way. And a lot of that can be mitigated by having metrics that go across departments and communication that goes across departments. And so hopefully this body of work and processes uh, promotes that and allows you to, to mitigate that. And I think it's probably the primary reason you started with ideal customer profile and buyer persona. Because if you go through all the work of building the system and it's in that sort of machine that you've built is churning out the, the wrong clients that are, aren't going to stick around for the full term of their contract. Yeah. I mean, the highest points of failure happen around that, right? In terms of being rejected or churn or, um, you know, we'll get to one of your lightning round questions in a moment, but a lot of like negotiating at the end of the quarter comes back to the conversation you had in the beginning and the inception of the deal and what they cared about. And if that's been wrong all along, well, I hate to break your heart, but it's not going to close either way, no matter how hard you push at the end of the quarter. You're hundred percent right. And one of the, one of the sort of common themes that we've mentioned a couple of times is this is something, this playbook is something that you have to keep coming back to. It, it has to be a living document. It can't just, it's not just something you can write once and it's going to continue to provide value over months and months and months. If you just let it sit there and collect dust in your Google drive. So how do you like, aside from, so we've talked, I sort of alluded to one of the things I like to do, which is building on what you said, which is make somebody own that. And then sure. whenever you onboard somebody new, um, they have to, they sort of go through and update it. That's sort of my way of doing things, which is, you know, bootstrappy, starty, startup-y, kind of hacky. Um, I, I understand you do, you like to do a little bit, something more formal quarterly. Can you talk to me about that? Yeah. So I think like you just, you need to k create mechanical accountability levers. And so that's today, let's put a quarterly meeting on the calendar for the, the playbook leadership team or whatever we might want to call it. Maybe it's not the first day of the quarter, but we're all going to get together. And if you show up with that meeting with no updates as to your section, well, kind of looks silly. So let's codify it that way. Another way we could codify this, when we look at general onboarding, let's talk to our head of people and talk about how we onboard new employees. There should be separate sessions for each section of this playbook. And when a new, uh, hopefully, class of employees comes on board so that they can learn together, when they come on board, those are calendar uh, invites that are put on their calendar. And you, Colin, or me, Andrew, uh, we're assigned to that session to teach these folks. And so, you know, if you care about, like, creating a good, good first impression for your new colleagues, you're, you're going to tighten up. You're going to make sure you know your stuff and that you're teaching this well. That's another lever of accountability. We talk about tests against the playbook. So creating a test, maybe someone else creates a test versus someone who creates the section of the playbook. And if there's a misalignment, everybody's failing the test. Well, let's look at what we're teaching here and what's actually going on with this section. And then again, I think like you find rising employees who have a chip on their shoulder who want to get into leadership and you say, of course, it's not a, an overnight process, but this is your chance to prove it. Here's a little piece of something you can own and perfect. Um, and, and we'll see how you do with that. We'll give you a little bit more ownership over time. And so again, assigning it to individuals is very helpful as well. And then the, the last thing I'll say is there are a lot of great e-learning tools out there that where you can plug these things in as part of onboarding. Like we're pretty tight with the folks over at Lessonly. You know, they do a lot of stuff with folks to onboard them and, and actually like codifying this into an educational asset that you kind of go through rather than plopping it on someone's desk. But the key is to be mechanical about it, right? And objective about it. Did people fail the test? Did they succeed? Was the, was the session scheduled or was it not? 
things like that I think are helpful. Totally. I haven't checked out Lessonly myself, but I've heard a ton about it. Um, we've had Kyle Roach and Justin Clifford on the podcast very, very recently. Kyle, I think was episode 99. Justin, I don't think has been published yet. And then we've got one more person from uh, Lessonly in the Hopper. So nice. They're it, great. They're great. It's really strong culture over there. It's, it's very rare. You see sort of everybody on sort of message talking about the same core ideas as you interview across, you know, I've had a few companies where I've interviewed, you know, three or four people or two or three, sometimes two or three, sometimes, two, you know, four or five, um, across the same company. And you get sort of a different message. Lesson Lee was the first one where it's like, wow, everybody has like, this is a cult. This is yeah. a, <laughs> in, in a very good way. And if you guys are listening, I mean it like in a kind way we'll that love everybody, you less yeah, everybody's bought in. They've all drank the same Kool-Aid. But like, you know why their culture, I mean, I think their culture is fabulous because I know a lot of the operators over there and they're great people, but you create the culture starting on day one, right? Like people get that first impression when they walk in the door. And if it's like, Hey, you're winging it. Good luck getting ramped up on your sales job. Well, that, that attitude's probably going to persist and, and down the line, what you're, you know, crap in crap out down the line, you're going to get poor performance because they've been winging it. Mm -hmm. Um, Culture helps with sales retention. Culture helps with ramp up. And this is definitely a cultural asset and tool. Totally agree. And it's a topic for a different day, but the culture and hiring process on, on the, you know, on the, any team is, has been some of the most impactful things that we've done. Definitely. Perfect. Andrew loved having you on, on I feel like we could have gone hours deep on each of these subjects, uh, but sure we wanted we to could. keep it kind of high level so that we could get a, a feel for what are the things that are important to you when you're building that first playbook. Um, I do have some, some rapid fire questions for you. If you're ready, let's do it right on let's do it. when you're uh, as an SDR, how do you get people to respond to your emails? Yeah. So I think again, it comes down to really good research, um, making a first conversation feel like a second conversation and you have to have a compelling reason you're reaching out which cannot be that I stumbled upon your LinkedIn profile um, or your company looks interesting. It's really easy. I'll give you a quick hack to do it. Set up Google alerts for your industry and for the companies you're after. And when something relevant comes up, but there's all sorts of other tools that do this, you can at least mention that in the first sentence and it feels a lot more relevant. So that would be one of my top tips to get people to actually respond and spend time with you. I love the Google alerts thing because even if you're not even if you're not finding that many of your prospects in there, you're getting general news about the industry, which makes you much more well-rounded on those calls. Yeah. I mean, stop opening with how's the weather and start opening with like, did you see that like this thing happened in our industry? It's amazing. Here's what we've been talking about when it comes to that all day long at our office. hundred percent. And so let's say somebody replied, replied to your email or maybe they didn't, they opened it a bunch of times. You cold call them. They've answered, but they're now they're brushing you off. How do you handle that? Sure. So it depends on the answer that they've given you. Uh, if they, you know, answered and gave you a little bit of some of the answers to your qualification questions, how timely is this? Is there a need? Things like that. Like let's say you had a quick phone call with them. I revisit that. I revisit the inception of the process. Sometimes I use a pretty uh, sympathetic approach and in, in like, hey, wh why were you interested to begin with, right? Obviously something intrigued you. I'm happy to focus on that. And so I think bringing it back to the beginning for folks you've spoken to a little bit is helpful, but let's, let's pretend that like they're really just ignoring you and they're not, um, they're not being helpful. Um, I, I think that's when you think about multiple channels, you think about varying perhaps the tone or length of what it is that you're saying. Maybe I want to go strong on this email for compelling reasons to reach out. Maybe I want to go stronger on this email with truly value-based collateral or advice that might be helpful to them. Maybe this email is going to be more about social proof. Maybe, shame on me, I'm saying email, 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 maybe it's a phone call, maybe it's a trade show, maybe it's some other channel you need to break through. But if you're just doing the same old crap again and again and again, uh, I mean, what do they say? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Uh, you need to at least A, B test to evolve and get to the ultimate answer. Right on. Would be my quick answer to that. Beautiful. Last question, when you, want to, when you need to push at the end of the quarter, what do you do? Yep. So two things that I do, um, I, again, go back to the inception of why we were talking to begin with. Uh, and there's um, a really good book by Chris Voss um, that, you know, a lot of us have, have recently read on negotiation. And he talks about, um, I believe what's called normative reasoning. 
you said you wanted to do this. You said this was important to you. It's hard for us to go back against things we said. Uh, and so if you are using normative reasoning and reminding folks of what they said or what they were hoping to accomplish and, and, and also showing that you're thoughtful and you're actively listening all along, well, that can nudge folks sometimes because then it's like, yeah, I did say that. I don't, I don't want to fail on my own accord. And, and by the way, hey, you've been really thoughtful in considering that. So that's one strategy I like to try. Um, I personally hate, or at least I hate right out of the gate, hey, we'll give you a 10% discount if you close this Friday. Um, I think John Barrows, again, really good on this one. There's a lot of flexibilities you can offer before that in terms of like, hey, let's discuss what might be holding you back. Um, a lot of times people try to do two things. They try to throw a lot of value at folks to move them along and they try to reduce prices. The only friction point that's stopping the ball from moving forward. And the reality is there's probably other friction points that are stopping them. Um, you know, there might be fear of implementation. Uh, hey, you guys charge a training cost that, you know, we're actually really scared about what it's going to take to train folks on this. Could you be flexible there? Um, Maybe they need to hear from another reference and that's a flexibility that you give them in talking to another expert customer. But again, end of the quarter, depends on how pinched for time you are and how much you've gone down your give get matrix. I think there's a lot of flexibilities you can offer before cutting right to the friction point, which might not be a friction point at all. You don't have to do the discount right off the bat. I love it when reps don't lead with the discount. When they're on my, on my team, we, we don't discount at all. And uh, we'll throw extra value in to like what's, you know, for what's good for the customer. But when, when we moved away from quarters, we moved away from and a quarter discounting like crazy. Yeah, totally. And like we have a big saying around here at Bowery Capital that thoughtfulness sells. And I think offering some of those other valuable things are way more thoughtful and, and creates a way better kind of, you know, first impression in terms of them getting onboarded with the product than, hey, the answer here is like, we'll just reduce some of the dollars, but we're not going to try and help you more in other ways. It's too for, easy. For sure. It's, it's a value-based relationship. It's not a price-based relationship. And I think <laughs> as soon as you take it to the, your first option or the first thing that you go to when you're trying to create more value is, oh, I can charge you less. Yeah. Then you, you set the tone for this relationship. And then I'm the guy that can get you a discount. I'm always the guy that can get you a discount. And I don't want to be the guy that can get you a discount. I want to be the guy that helps you you know, accomplish your goal that helps you get X, Y, and Z that helps you get that huge ROI. So I like throwing more at it as opposed to taking less for it. Yeah, absolutely agree. Perfect. Um, Andrew, this has been awesome having you on. I want to give you, I like to give all the guests a, uh, a way to sort of promote what they're working on. So why don't we do uh, move to the, the cold call role play? Sure. Right. Um, Who am I? What am I wearing? Yeah. So uh, let's, pretend that you are, um, you're an entrepreneur who's founded something successfully before. And we know that you are in the market, um, to, you know, consider raising again, uh, for your new venture or your new company rather. And of course we are venture capitalists at the seed stage who, who believe that we have a pretty promising thing on the other side of that. So with that said, you want to go on in the cold, cold scenario here. All right, let's do it. Ring, ring. Hey, this is Colin. Hi, Colin. Uh, thanks so much for your time today. This is Andrew Odo from Bowery Capital. Um, I'll kind of cut to the chase pretty quickly here. The reason I'm reaching out is that I've been a huge fan of the Predictable Revenue podcast for a while. I couldn't believe your success with that and, and your recent exit there. Um, and so I heard you're starting a new venture, and I thought I might reach out to introduce myself as someone who could help you out with that. Um, are you up for chatting for two minutes on this, or did I catch you at a bad time? I just, I'm just about to step into a meeting. Okay. I'll be really quick. Uh, you, before you go into your meeting, uh, if you want to give me your email address, I can give you some ideas of how we help entrepreneurs. But basically, uh, on top of providing seed stage capital, we help folks out with their sales acumen uh, and getting up to speed for their go-to market. Maybe you're on your way to a, a sales meeting. Uh, maybe we could have a follow-up call to this where we talk to our entrepreneurs about how they can get the most out of their meetings and how they can sell successfully. Um, so if that sounds good to you, you want some free advice and, and banter on where we can help you with that. Um, would love to get your email address and follow up if that sounds good. That sounds great, man. <laughs> but you, but you put the phone down before you gave it to me. So <laughs> here's my, here's me writing and handing it to you. Yeah. That, so that, that that's work. Yeah. Uh, I'll, but I'll, I'll elaborate 30 more seconds. So we don't, we don't do a ton of cold outbound, but one thing we've launched recently that I'll, I'll kind of take a moment to promote is, um, we're doing an eight-week summer boot camp here in New York City for getting up to speed on your go-to-market strategy. 
Um, we're doing this in tandem with SVB. And so with, you know, the law of reciprocity in mind, which we discussed today, we're giving away a lot of our strategies and content for free to, to show to early entrepreneurs. Here's how we help out. Um, it helps us, right? We get to know entrepreneurs earlier on. It de-risks the process for us a little bit. And so that's one thing I've been, I've been pitching lately. And uh, it's less of a cold call type of thing, but it's some of the strategies we just talked about, right? Thinking about the channels through which you can promote something and thinking about one minute of value for five, five for 30 and 30 for more. And so I'll kind of end on that and say, uh, you know, thank you for having me on and, and the valuable things you've even taught me today. I, I really appreciate it. Right on. Thanks, Andrew. We'd love to have you on. And thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. Oh, and before I go, if somebody's interested in any of those programs you manage or they want to get a copy of the playbook we were talking about, how can they do that? So they can connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty good there. Um, the playbook, happy to, to work with you to distribute it. Or they can also hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, and we also have a great blog that they can check out where we describe these programs and, and how to interact with us at our events. So I, I will double up on that. The blog is great. I do tend to read it from time to time. Awesome. It's one of the few that I do actually read. So thank Love you. That. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate you having us on, Colin. Right on. Thanks, Andrew. And uh, see everybody next week.